Hi everyone, it's Kemp Corner here from Enterprise Lab. I hope you're well and welcome to another fiery edition of the League of Disruptors show. And the reason why I say it's fiery, boy oh boy have I got a guest on for you guys today. It's an absolute honour and treat to have my friend Michael Sower in the house. Michael, how are you? I'm wonderful, Ketan. Uh, so good to be here. Oh, I was looking forward to it. Yeah, I know. He's, apparently, we've got to be quick because we're going to finish by three o'clock because uh, you've got special guests coming with a trivial problem that needs to be solved, right? <laughs> uh, you know, this billionaire entrepreneurs, you know, and the silly little problems, you know. <laughs> He's like, shall I buy the island or shall I buy another company? I'm like, who has time to deal with this shit? <laughs> Wow, well, let's... How many islands do you need? Yeah. How many islands do you need? Yeah, how, many, how many islands do you need? Oh my what's wrong god. Island, you know? What's wrong with Naked Island? You know? What is that you cannot do on Naked Island? <laughs> For those of you who don't know what the hell we're talking about, Michael Silver's got a date with Destiny, and that's Mr. Branson coming up at 3 o'clock. He's going to be telling you what company to buy, what island to buy next. Uh, this is uh, this is you this is what you're going to get for the next hour. You're going to get a full-on, no holds barred, proper, proper conversation that's going down. But let right. me start off a little bit about uh, Mr. So. I mean, he's a he's a best-selling author. He's been in a coaching film. Uh, he's been he's got this whole model about he don't he doesn't just improve people's lives. He changes them. And you know, for someone um, who I've recently got to know in the industry, this guy is moving and shaking and disrupting the way people actually are developing themselves personally. And that's why I wanted Michael on the show. I want him to really give you guys insights on what it takes to be brilliant, what it takes not to just improve but to change. So Michael, please tell our audiences more about you, where you know your background, how you got to where you are today. That'd be great. Thanks, Kevin. Very humble beginnings. Um, I came here from Poland um, 11 years ago uh, on the bus. 27 hours because I couldn't afford the plane ticket. Not because I had a fear of flying or something like that, right? <laughs> I couldn't afford the plane ticket. Um, and after 27 hours in a bus, I, I, I got here. I remember it was a hot summer day, uh, 2005. So the, co the coach got to uh, uh, Victoria Station. And then the long journey uh, by bus to New Cross, where I spent my first weeks on the squat with my girlfriend at the time and, and a couple of friends. The only reason I could come here in the first place, <clears throat> sorry, because the friends uh, that I had here were kind enough to lend us money to begin with. Because uh, I literally came without a penny. Uh, so just, you know, all the money I had I spent on these bus tickets and we, we got here with lots of stuff. So like I knew I was coming here to stay and, and I did come without money and at the age of 22, I did come without money and I did come without any idea as to what I'm going to do, but I came with this enormous, enormous hunger. A hunger that I know I'm going to be successful. Sorry, I knew I'm going to be successful. I didn't know how I'm going to get there exactly. But I often say to my clients or like people in general, you, you, you don't need to see all the steps. You don't need to know all the steps. Just, just think about the first step and the second step. You know, one, take one step at a time and do what you can do and then figure out the next step later. Mm. So I knew the first step for me was to come here to this paradise of a society and paradise of economy. You know, those of you from here complaining about this economy, you need to go to Poland for a month. <laughs> <laughs> so I will start a business in Poland and then if I can, we can talk about how difficult it is here. You know, it's like if you can't succeed in, in London, you just don't have it in you, so, so come back to having your fucking nine to six, you know, or just stick to your job or, you know, stay with your mother, don't leave your parents' house because this is a fucking paradise. And of course, the fact, the fact that coming here, I had this, I had this, uh, this mindset, you know, like I, I, I assume that it, it, it's, um, it's an environment in which you can be successful. I assume it's a, environment full of opportunity so i knew i'm gonna have to work hard like it doesn't matter where you are you're gonna have to work hard if you want what you if you want to get somewhere mm. you know you want to have this mindset that it's possible right like this is this is the first step um so i spent the first few years um having and growing rather successful career in fashion retail but you know i was good at it and and they were paying me very well for what you can get in fashion retail, but it was an example of winning in the wrong game. 
Um, and I would say that the fact that you are good at something doesn't mean that you're supposed to be doing it because if you're smart, and I would imagine everybody listening to, to this kind of content, you know, you're not dumb. So if you're smart, of course you're going to be good at more than one thing. So the fact that you are good at what you do and everybody says, hey, you know, why would you leave this job you're doing so well? Because I hate it. No, but you're so good at it. Why would you want to leave it? Because I hate it, because I don't love it. Right? You know, you're smart, you can be good at many things. So I was good at running shops, I was good at a fashion retail manager, but like I didn't like it. But I wasn't complaining and, and feeling so I didn't feel sorry for myself that I came here and I had to do something I didn't like that much. I appreciated the fact that I had a job that was paying well enough for me to 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 do my thing, pay the bills and then pursue my passion, which from an early age was uh, personal development, mm. right? So, a few years before becoming a coach, I was already immersed in personal development, working on myself. So, when I became a coach, when I decided to become a coach in 2010, so six years ago, and then transitioned, transitioned to coaching full-time a year later in 2011, I was already in a very good place within myself. And I think as far as... Um, my success story as a coach uh, is concerned. One of the elements which are definitely important is the fact that um, I entered the industry um, having already my shit sorted out. Right? Which I always say, listen, you know, if you want to charge people um, to deliver service, you probably want to look or uh, come across as someone who already has that thing that people pay you to have. Mm. Right? So, you know. Uh, I, I don't have I don't have um, any unusual story to tell as far as my childhood is concerned, you know. But then, at 17, being one of the best high schools in my city, I, I quit that school all of a sudden, and, and everybody was in shock. You know, my parents thought I'm going to be a doctor, lawyer again. You know, <laughs> enough. I was smart enough for them to think that I knew I, I could be if I wanted to, but I just didn't want to. I didn't even want to finish the high school I was in. I was like, fuck this. <laughs> boring. I'm bored out of my ass. And this is not some story of me getting into fucking crack, crack cocaine and, and you know, mm. or escaping to Thailand. I was just, I was, I was there every day until I, I realized this is bullshit. You know, and, and to be honest, if I had the balls to quit school at 16, I would already quit it at 16. I just didn't have the balls to face my parents until I was 17. So I already knew, I already from the age of 16, I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to graduate from this school or from any other school for that matter. It just, it's not because I'm against school. It's not because I think this is bullshit. It's just, it was bullshit for me. Mm. Looking back, I was right because, you know, I'm a living example of someone who, just like Richard Branson, or Jobs, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I often say how there's no one path to success, yes. right? You know, I'm not comparing my level of success to it, but where I'm going, I will be as successful as they are in, in their fields, right? It's just I chose different fields. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I've never been interested in, in starting a computer company or, or running airlines, but, you know, when you look at top 1% people in different industries, they have certain things in common, you know, and obviously, depending on the industry, the income will be different, but at the end of the day, as you know, as you guys listening know, it's... It's not about the money per se, the money is just a byproduct and we do what we do because we love what we do and as Steve Jobs said, the only way to do great job, the, the only, the only, how did he put it, the only, the only way to be great at what we do is to love what we do. Yeah, absolutely. So, so okay, I quit school at 17, I was into art at the time, so I was playing instruments. I'm a failed uh, jazz trumpet player, by the way. I wanted to be a wild, not wild, white Miles Davis. <laughs> Um, jazz trumpet, did you say? Yeah, jazz trumpet. So uh -huh. I wanted to be uh, my husband, so I wanted to be the best trumpet player on the planet. Um, and when I realized, I went to the music school and they sucked me from the music. So I didn't quit, they sucked me. Um, when I realized I can't be the best because of the reason I have no control over, which is how my muscles around my lips are built. So I couldn't, I couldn't play high pitch notes. And when you think about trumpet or saxophone, the magic happens when, when the musicians hit that high pitch note, right? Mm. So I could, I just couldn't, physically couldn't. 
you know, long story short, when I, you know, I realized and, and I got a second opinion on that, that I can't be the best. So you can still be average. You can be very good at being average. I was like, no, no, you, you don't understand. I'm either the best at some point, And if I know from the start, I can't be the best. I don't want to play this game. Yeah. I don't want to play the game. I know I cannot win. Right. So that was at 17 uh, as well. So it took me 10 years to discover my next passion, which is coaching. And right now, again, Steve Jobs said, uh, you, we can only judge the experience from the future. Things happen to us. and like, how did it, how this could happen to me? This is so unfair. It's like, I don't understand. So, okay, give it, give it a month, give it a year, give it 10 years. You'll be able to look back and understand why this happened to you mm -hmm. or this didn't happen to you. So it took me 10 years to look back and understand why I play trumpet. I found a new form of expression, which is just another form of expression that I look at it, mm -hmm. being coaching. And yes, you can impact people by playing instrument beautifully, no doubt about that. But I feel that now I'm in a position to impact even more people um, uh, by doing what I do, which is coaching, speaking, writing. Right? So, you know, I accepted the fact that I couldn't do that. I found a new passion, a, a, a new career path, and, and a new life path, uh, I could say, uh, in coaching. And, you know, I haven't stopped since. It's been a, a fantastic journey, starting from a very bottom. Obviously, every coach, Tony Robbins included, starts with the first client, yeah. right? But there's just no other way to start. Um, my first clients were paying 20 pounds per session uh, five years ago, and I had a full practice. Uh, I, I had a full practice ever since. Uh, so between 20 and 30 clients at any given time, what was changing was um, my confidence in myself as a coach, my experience, yeah. obviously, through coaching and coaching and coaching seven days a week for the first two and a half years. And as my experience was going up and, and my confidence in myself, my ability as a coach, my fees would go up. So in five years, I went from you know, 20 pounds per session, like I said, to being one of the highest paid life coaches in the UK, uh, you know, top 1% top highest paid coaches in the world. Yeah, you're not, you're not on 20 pound a session anymore, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, if you, ever, if you ever get a chance to, to go and see Michael at his house, he makes the best amazing coffee, I'm telling you. I went over to see Michael and... Uh, just for that reason. Just for that reason. I just came for the coffee. I don't want to, I don't want to speak to Michael. I just like, dude, I just want a coffee, mate. You know? <clears throat> it's just... I just want to go back a little bit here. I mean, you know, you have just actually outlined every, um, you know, some similarities in a lot of the people that have come on this show in terms of, um, especially about the environment where you didn't like something, you hated it, you were doing it for the, almost to, to a certain reason for the sake of doing it. And it was all about that transition into doing what you, moving into what you love. Right the way from your education, you weren't, it's not that edu you weren't good at education or education wasn't appropriate for you. You just didn't fit that mold. It's very much like myself. I, I left university after the second lecture in my, in my course by asking the question to the professor, you know, have you ever designed a car? Because I wanted to become a car designer. He said no, so I left. And you're right, you know, I had the same same thing, the high expectations from your family and like, you know, the next thing for me was the pitch of my life and the negotiation of my life to uh, to actually move out of education into work. 22 years old, you're crap broke, completely broke. You, you got a bus here after, you know, getting some money from your friends just to get across here. You're, you're squatting in New Cross, like you say. You've got no money, but you've got one thing, you've got a hunger, okay? You know, you you know that hunger is taking you towards this career in uh, fashion retail, and you at the end of the day, it's the hunger of you wanting to be the best you can be that's elevated you in the career that you've done. But uh, um, and, and I'm going to be going and taking some feedback from the audience already because we've got a lot of people that have commented. Um, but it's a bit like what Maya has just said here. Maya Chudzik has just said about connecting dots. You've had little milestones within your life, and these dots you've now started to connect this journey through to where you are today. It's not like you just came onto the stream and say, hey, I'm Super Mike and I'm now gonna be a super coach and I'm gonna do all these kind of things. But, you know, understanding that you, you came into the market with a very, very competitive price product, but you filled, you know, your purpose was to fill your diary, filled your schedule and not just five days, seven days a week, 
But why are you doing that? Not just for earning every £20 for each session, but it's your personal learning. How am I becoming a better coach, right? So I think this all goes down to mindset. You know, for you, you know, for me, it's everything I've heard from what you've just said here, it's all come from this deep rooted desire from your heart and your head <clears throat> of saying, you know, you couldn't, you didn't have those answers, you know, when you're 17 and 22, but you just knew there was something there that you were going to be brilliant at. And this is what you wanted to move towards. And it was putting yourself into that journey, which is the most important part here. Would you agree? Yes. For my teenage years, it was very much, thank you for complimenting my coffee, by the way. I confirm it is really good coffee. <laughs> he doesn't drink it, that's the thing. He has it. <laughs> I've been told so many times over the last three years I've been leaving here that it's good. I have just had to believe. You have to, you have to listen to feedback and take it on board. That's what they say, it's right? Not, it's not even that. You get a little biscuit with it as well. I'm telling you, he, uh, he knows that he's on point. This man over here is on point. You know what? When I talk about attention to detail, this is why you have got your 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 listening to someone who's in the top one percent for you know for 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 paying uh, or getting paid to coach people because it's the attention to detail, every minutia. You know he will make sure you sit in the right place. He will make sure that the ambience is right, the lighting's correct, that your the temperature's correct. I mean we haven't even started any session and all of a sudden it's just an environment. And this is what I mean, the fact that you have, you have such minute attention to detail that, you know, no one can know, you know, is this something that you, that's been with you since you were 16, 17, always kind of had this real attention to detail thing? Uh, Ketan, it's, um, it's something I definitely pay a lot of attention to. Um, and, and there's one person who does hate it, and that's my girlfriend, because she has to leave, right? <laughs> I would say, honey, what's happening upstairs is secondary, right? But here, from all these places that clients can see or prospective clients can see on people like yourself that just meet to meet for a coffee, this has to be immaculate, you know? So I'm, 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 I'm pain in the ass for her because, you know, we don't, we don't cook, but like you make some tea and then you spill some tea on the floor and I'm like, honey, you just spill. So, you know, I'm OCD, which helps. And they often say like OCD can be pain in the ass, but it helps in business. Yeah. In fact, just to give you an example, in five years of coaching, uh, two and a half years, seven days a week, and then the, the last two and a half years, uh, five times a week only, um, <laughs> I only double booked myself tw uh, once. I only made one mistake as far as the schedule is concerned. I had two people showing up for the consultation at the same time. Thank God, one came 10 minutes early and I could tell them whatever, I don't remember now. But in five years, only made, so I do make mistakes yeah. of this kind. So, you know, as you pointed out, it, it, you know, especially when you charge premium, it's like when you go to H&M to buy a shirt and there's nothing wrong with that, I used to do it when I, when I was poor, just kidding. <laughs> uh, just kidding, just kidding. I never, I never liked H&M anyway, but... Let's say when you when you go to buy a shirt, it's like I used to work for Zara, right? And people would come and complain. No, you know they bought a shirt and it wasn't something came out like after six months. I said, and I was I didn't say that at the time. I was just doing my job. I was being professional. Yeah. But I was thinking to myself, you spend twenty nine quid for a shirt and you expect it to be the quality of fucking Prada. There's a reason Prada, whatever example, yeah. charges so much more for the product because it's a different quality. So putting the quality on the side, the experience. There's a certain experience that you can take and expect when you go to shop on High Street versus the experience that you that you expect when you go to shop on Bond Street. Mm. Those of you not even in London <coughs> Street, like over, Bond Street is, uh, you know, with, like designer brands here, whatever, Gucci's and Prada's, right? So, so, you know, I try as much as I can to the best of my ability, recreate the, the environment or the feel you get when you go and buy expensive stuff, when you go to Rolex shop as opposed to when you go to buy a Swatch. And, and, and I, you know, we understand that I, I get this whole thing of, you know, why, you know, the difference between why is it that you can't 
go into a, a, a Rolls Royce or a Bentley showroom. In fact, there's not many Bentley showrooms on this planet in that respect. And buy a Bentley, uh, you know, with for 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 six thousand pounds or seven thousand pounds, you're probably lucky to get uh, just a wing mirror for that. Um, and the whole and the whole and the, the whole purpose behind that is it takes six hours to make a Toyota and it takes six months to create that that Bentley. Sick. Everything is done with uh, with. Love. I'm not saying that you know Toyota don't have love in their business. It's more the fact that they are they're a practicality. So it's. I think what I'm kind of getting to here is is that there are people that come into this market and they see that there are others that are you know charging such extortionate prices and they think oh my how how could they do this and why should they do this and but you know at the end of the day we've just explained two things attention for detail and premium service you you create an experience for your for your clients which which is it's a part of the process and the service because that you know it allows them to feel into this thing that you know um, as, as some of the comments are talk, talking about is that I'm paying for a premium service and this is what I'm getting. I'm getting something which isn't in a in a coffee shop. It's not in just a, you know, uh, it's not just in a, a random environment just built up. There's not a lot of noise. Everything's been designed for that client in mind. You know, and I'm going to come to your uh, your work ethic uh, later uh, in a bit later on. We're about 25 minutes in. We've only got another 35 minutes. You've got Michael Serwer, the main man today. So make sure, guys, if you're watching this uh, live, get your questions in for him because I'm sure he will answer honestly, truthfully, and very transparently these questions you can for bet you. Money. Yeah, you can bet <laughs> I just want to see who's online, basically. Just say some props. Beju, Daniel, uh, Daniel Merritt is on tomorrow. Enley's on saying hi. Um, Car Aj Chukri is so saying you're liking all the last bits. Liam McQueen's on, Anna Kareen, Martin Mustafa's on as well. Um, Maya Chudzik on, Lavelda Smith. I know that we're going to get some commentary from Lavelda. Alex Springer's in the house as well. Good to see you here. Yeah, he's saying what's up. Beiju saying hello. <laughs> Beiju turns around and says, Ikigai. Ikigai? Ikigai? What does Ikigai mean? Ikigai, I think we're going to be talking about personal, you know, about missions, personal development. We're talking about these whole, the whole transformation of what it is that you want to be, who, uh, where do you come from, the ethics of where you're working. Lavelle just mentioned that not playing the game you can't win. That's so me when it comes to sports. Okay, so Lavelle just stay away from sports. Uh, Maya's connecting the dots, as we said, is an awesome thing. Michael, when are you starting uh, the coffee shop? Lavelle asking. Are you planning to open up a coffee shop because of your great coffees? Actually, now when you when you said it, maybe I should. <laughs> maybe I should. Yeah. Coffee, coffee and coaching, Sarah style. <laughs> style. <laughs> um, oh, lovely! Maya said, said you're the best Starbucks in Mayfair." <laughs> So, okay, you've definitely it's the most expensive one as well, I gotta tell you. Yeah, exactly. So, Michael, look, we, we've got through this transition, you know, we don't want to do a ranks to riches. You've gone through, you've invested in your mind and in your heart um, that you, you, you know, you, you have a passion and a desire for the personal development industry. I'm sure there was elements of the industry that you looked at and said to, to yourself, this is broken, this is wrong, and I'm going to do it my way, the way I believe so, which, you know, part of this attention to detail and creating the premium service is all about. What other things um, did you have to do, you know, in terms of, you, you, you know, you were in fashion retail all this time and now you're, you're a high paid um, coach. So what, 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 what took you through the transition? What did you have to do? Right, so I don't think that my raw coaching talent is beyond anything you can find elsewhere. So I do believe I have a raw coaching talent, but so do many other coaches out there. Yeah. So that's not what made the difference. And guys, when you think about it, uh, it doesn't matter how talented you are at what you do. If nobody knows about you, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. You can be the best coach, but if nobody knows about you. It doesn't matter. So, I, I understood. You know, I understood early on that uh, it's not about having coaching qualifications. I don't have any coaching qualifications uh, whatsoever. Um, you know, and and you know, when I think about the most successful coaches on the planet, they don't have it either. Exactly. Right? <laughs> the first clue when you ask yourself. <laughs> You don't need to have coaching qualification. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not going to hurt you, it can help, but you don't need it to be successful, right? And I'm just a, another example of that. So, what I had, what, what helped me was the fact that, 
you know, what, what can be two biggest motivators for us as human beings? One is the desire, and the other one is the desperation, right? So I had two of them going for me at the same time, which helped. So on one side, there was a desire to, to coach, to have a full coaching practice, to make money from coaching, to become the best I can be as a coach, mm -hmm. right? So this was for me. But then I was desperate to make money because at the time, now I would just call you, Kat, I'm better Tom, I had no money. Nobody to call to, to, to borrow some money yeah. to pay. So it's like, unless I make money, I, I wasn't in retail anymore. And I was here, I was maxing out on my credit cards and I just had to make money. So I really threw myself out. I had no money to invest. So um, I learned from a friend how to build a simple website. So, you know, what you see right now, it's, it's actually still the same kind of uh, um, uh, format of the website I initially had five years ago and, and I did it because I did it out of necessity the simplicity you can see now was out of necessity back then because that's all I could do and then that that simplicity became one of my uh, one of the pillars of my brand mm -hmm. right? so it's interesting how it works out sometimes I was like fuck I wish to have more complex website but that's all I can do mm -hmm. and then Oh, actually, this works because it's so different to everybody else. Sits website who had the money to spend for even simple design, right? So I did the website by myself, and I just threw myself out there. Out there, I started to experiment with Google advertising. I really learned how to use it, how to maximize on the budget, whatever the small budget I had at the time. I was on the phone with Google all the time, asking them how can I improve. Um, and then in the same time, I set up three meetup groups um, and I was running, in 2012 alone, I gave approximately 200 talks on 60 to 70 uh, different personal development related topics. Wow. So not coaching during the day, I was giving talks up to five times a week, three to five times a week on different topics. So I was, I was, I was building the tribe um, and obviously you know, even though I was in charge for the initial talks and I was charging later, I would I would promote my coaching. I was getting some clients through that as well. So I just threw myself out there and I went from uh, you know not making any money from coaching to making thirty four k in my first year uh, of coaching uh, in two thousand and twelve. And then from that point, I was pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, pushing. It. I was putting my fees up. So very much a story of hassle. Coming back to your question. Yeah. Very much a story of hustle more than anything else. It's not like, oh, he must be so talented as a coach. So like, yes, I am talented, but I know so many fucking talented coaches who are, even if they're not broke, they're not doing too well, they struggle, right? So yeah. talent is, you know, you know that. Like, talent is, talent in itself means fuck all. Like, oh, you are a great singer, you're so talented, but you're too fucking lazy to go and, and start like Ed Sheeran and in every fucking pub they would, you know, let yeah. him in playing, uh, sleeping on his friends' couches here in London, you know, and and through the experience, he could only further develop his his basic talent for singing he had. So I had some basic talent for coaching, I'm sure I did, I felt like I did, but the coach I am today, it's nothing comparing to the coach I was five years ago, because what made the difference from going from being talent, kind of talented to being uh, you know, shit hot on a good day, right? Is the five years of coaching my ass off? It's like you don't become an amazing painter by, by, you know, taking canvas for the first time and fucking creating a masterpiece. You know, Mozart, a great example. Only the only the middle to late work of Mozart is considered as the genius work. Mm. Did for the first fifteen years is considered as just whatever. Mm. So it took him fifteen years, approximately. I don't remember the exact number. Yeah. 15 years to get to the point where he could, when he was in a position to create work that is now considered as genius. Yeah. And you think that you're going to do a fucking coaching diploma, read five books, go to fucking Tony Robbins UPW, and, yeah. and you ex suddenly make money as a coach. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. And this is just an example I, of one. I, 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 I totally, totally concur with this. Um, 
you know, we, 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 you, you're talking about the Mozart, you know, in terms of the classical pieces, Van Gogh had this whole thing where someone came up to Van Gogh and says, you know, you're a great painter, can you, can you draw a picture of me? And, um, you know, he, he took out a pencil and he did this thing in 30 seconds and charged $30,000 for it. And when she goes, uh, what, you know, why would I pay 30,000? He goes, it took me 30, 30 years. To, to be able to draw you in 30 seconds. So I think this whole, what we're picking up from this, visibility is number one. There's one thing that you did when you came in here, you started to become more and more visible. Like you say, if, if you're great at what you do, but no one knows you exist, then you're only as great as the bubble that you blow and in that respect. And, and then, but it's, you immerse yourself more and more. So I, I, I am, I'm also getting the feel that what you're doing is as you're taking on your clients, you're challenging your abilities as a coach more and more. So you're learning more and more and more in discovering what you can improve as a coach and what, where, where are the specifics in which you will, uh, which you can deliver uh, results in. Because, uh, you know, as professionals in, in, in this kind of industries, there are often advice that we give to our clients that we don't normally nurture in ourselves. So it's quite experimental in that respect. But at the same time, you know, you've invested in yourself heavily you know, in the fact of whether, you know, you bootstrapped, you did your own website and it is, simplicity is the key. You have too much bells and whistles on a website, people get lost. They've got to be able to get to the point as quickly as possible. So you've talked about so many different things here, but I'm going to kind of draw you back into this whole thing about this conversation that we're having very much about, um, oh, you know, if I do this system, this system and this system, that means that I'm going to become an industry sort of coach and stuff like this. I've heard some some horrific stories of, of people who are actually investing in courses, getting the certificates and then having to have these coaching interventions where someone is watching them coach someone else. And then, you know, to, to, to what extent at the end of the day um, that, that, that they almost fear that I can't come into the market and, and coach yet because I'm not qualified enough to do this. I think we all have a story, we all have an area of expertise, we all have an opinion. And I think what it, what you've demonstrated over five years is practice, not procrastinate, practice, not plan, just plan, plan and study, study, study. It's more of a, let's get out there, get our hands dirty and really keep working at it. And it's the only way that you're going to start to sort of rise up to the top. So in this environment now, you know, the work you do, it's transformational in, in a huge way. And uh, I just want you to give a little bit of insight into the world of um, what your clients experience when they work with Michael Sower. You mean apart from the coffee? Apart from the coffee. <coughs> like, well, I guess we need to ask them, right? That's not <laughs> no. like us. I want to ask you. I want, I want you to tell me what you think you're doing to them, because I'm sure your clients, if they're watching this, they're going to come up and tell me later. <laughs> See, Ethan, I, um, you know, I said it before that you, you will, in, in five years of coaching, yeah. uh, over 400 people, right? You will, you will find a few people, if you look hard enough, you'll find a few people who say, yeah, you know, it, it was good, right? So not, not all 400 plus will tell you, oh my God, my life has changed. My own fucking parents didn't recognize me, right? <laughs> it happened a few times, you know, uh, total transformation. Um, most of the time, we're talking about a, a visible improvement all the way to kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. But you will find people will say, yeah, it was, it was good, nothing really like, you know, it didn't quite work out as, as well as I would hope to, right? And, you know, every single one of those people, I could tell you that perhaps they didn't invest enough. Because I always say that paying for the service it's one thing, like you can pay a personal trainer, the best personal trainer on the planet to work with you for three months. Ultimately, to grow the muscle, you have to do the push up yourself, yeah. right? And he's not gonna go with you and follow you in the kitchen and see what you eat, right? Yeah. So you will never get 100% success rate in that regard, right? But where I'm going with this, so, you know, occasionally you get these kind of people who just kind of benefited a little bit from it only, mm -hmm. right? And one or two, you'll find one or two who say, you know, that didn't work at all, right? Which I totally accept. But I, I, I challenge you to find one person who will tell you that I didn't care about them. That I, I didn't care about them on a personal level. That I wasn't there for them. 
right? That I didn't reply to them within 24 hours, 365 a day, because that's my commitment to my clients. That's my commitment to my profession. So that's my commitment to myself, first of all, mm. then to my clients, then to my profession, which I which I love. You know, I believe this is the best profession. Whatever. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I still don't listen to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so that that's my commitment. It's like, I listen, you know, I'm not going to promise you anything. I, I can promise you that if nothing's going to happen, but you're going to work hard, you're going to follow the instructions, you're going to follow on things you commit to yourself mm-hmm. and nothing's going to happen. Mm-hmm. My promise to you is I'll give you your money back or I will work with you for another three or six months, whatever our initial agreement was, on me. So that I can promise you. Other than that, I can't promise a certain outcome but what I can promise you is a certain level of, of customer care yeah. or client care. Mm-hmm. Like I'll be there for you because that's how I operate. You know, my coaching is very personal, it's very intimate. Yeah, I mean, and this is the point I'm trying to get to because in this industry, it's, you know, yeah, fine. You know, there is, there is this line about valuing your service and what people have to pay. And we understand that people need to invest in themselves financially to have that skin in the game. But what you're yeah. talking about here is it's not just about financial investment. They've got to also invest invest holistically into themselves. They, you know, it's it's no it's no point paying you all of that money and you being able to apply all the time, the energy, the the attention to detail, the caring, the three six five, you know, twenty four hours a day type of connection to them. If it's not if it's not sinking in. You know, in that respect, I mean, it's one of the things that I do. I filter a lot in terms of I interview, engage a lot of my clients, and then I kind of it's almost I prescribe to them. Maybe you need to go and do this first, and then come back to me, or maybe we do this first, and then we move forward. But one thing that we um, and, and and the reason I'm moving uh, towards this line is I want to get your opinion about the ethics in what we do, very very shortly. But it's kind of a situation whereby. Um, some people are just driven by the cash. I mean, you came in and you said there were two parts, you know, the desirability of coaching and the desperation to make money in that respect. But that doesn't mean that you are out to rip people off. It was more of a, I'm driven to create wealth because I don't have it. And this is what, this is one of my circles of needs. And you're very honest about that. Cause I think a lot of people hide behind the front of their business and the value that they give and the passion that they have for the industry that they work in. But really the hidden agenda is I just need to make as much cash as possible. And this is where you find the coaches that are struggling basically. So coming back to this question about ethics, you see, I have a big chip on my shoulder about the industry. The industry has exploded over the last five or six, seven, six or seven years. So I think since you've been here, you've probably seen a massive uptake of the amount of life coaches and personal development coaches and you know, work coaches and whatever coaches are coming out uh, of every nook and cranny, which I don't have an issue with. But I think that we need to have some form of ethical responsibility to what we're, we're, we're applying to our client base. Um, what's your opinion on this whole thing of, you know, you, well, I, I, I can see it slanted that way because you said the word care, you care in this respect. But what are the, you know, what are your observations of the industry and what is it that you, you do within your own business to make sure that you never have a, even a slither of a crack of that type of stuff in you know that's happening in the industry in your business yeah, very 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 good industry and sorry very good industry very good industry but very good question um you know i hear this negative comments about personal developing industry and and i don't know whether it's because i'm so you know when you when you're in love with someone or something you lose the you know, you're not rational, yeah. you know. Like, I or maybe or maybe, it's, maybe it's that I want to believe so much that it's good out there. But like to answer your question, I have to divide. I have to separate personal development and coaching. I know coaching is a big part of personal development, but if I look at coaching, yeah. so forget about personal development. Forget about events and people selling from the stage and and online programs. If we're talking about one-to-one coaching, mm-hmm. I can't think about a coach, I certainly I know of or even I heard of, who was unethical to my definition of what ethical is. I don't care what it means to the, uh, you know, ethic professor in Harvard, you know, like, you know, I, I think about what's ethical for me and, and you know, I don't think, uh, you know, having said that, I don't think my um, my definition of ethics is, will be different to way different to like yours or somebody else listening to it, mm. right? 
So when I look at coaching, I see so many good people out there. Yeah. So good people. Like, think about it. If you are an asshole, if you are a fucking asshole, are you going to wake up thinking, hmm, maybe I should become a life coach and make money as I help people? No, if you are an asshole, you're going to have one week out of my life and you're going to shoot yourself in the head because all you hear is problems and challenges. So if you're not, not naturally empathetic person, if you're not naturally a good listener, this profession is going to freaking kill you, yeah. right? Not for you. So I see coaches as extremely good people. What they struggle with is the business side of things, which I try to help them with as much as I can. But in terms of ethics, I don't think there is, a, I, in my experience, there's, there's no issue there, right? When we look at personal development industry as a whole, then it's a different ball game, mm. right? And, you know, you will often find, not often, but sometimes you will find coaches, so people who wanted to become coaches, and then they realize that actually probably the money is even more interesting for them than this whole idea of helping people and actually meeting all of these people one-to-one, -one, spending time with them, and then maybe they got along the, along the line, I got a bit more greedy, and I thought, ooh, why don't I do what Tony Robbins does and do one event and sell the shit out of my products and make people freaking run to the back of the room like it's a, it's a fucking fitness event or it's a personal development event? What's up with this running to the back of the room? You know, it's like, is it the weight loss? Is it the step of the fucking weight loss program? You know, back to the back of the room, you know? The only thing missing is the whistle, you know? Like, three, two, one, go! I was like, like, you know, first time I was in the room, it was like, I think it was Tony Robbins' event, like when he was speaking at the uh, Personal Achievers Congress or whatever for four hours, like, Run to the room and I just looked around, people are running and I'm like, I didn't even move. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, you never see you running. Like, I don't even run when I'm on the, when I find myself on the street and there's a car. Like, I'm waiting for the car to stop. Even if it's zebra crossing. I'm like, I'm Michael fucking Sarah. I'm not running anymore. I'm getting carried away. I'm no, carried no, away. no, no, no. Do, do you know what? This is, the, no, that's absolutely, this is what I'm talking about and the fact that you care about what you do so much. You know, they're, they're, I mean, obviously, passion and passion's not enough in, in, in the world of business these days. You need to have a drive and a frustration, and um, you know, it, within that to, to put through. But you know, we look at look at the way you conduct in business, your attention for detail, the care that you put through. The reason I, 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 I bring up this in terms of ethics is sometimes it's like you mentioned the word greed. You know, it's this whole thing of sometimes we also have to understand. That as within this industry that our relationships could be with people for three hours or it could be for three years and um, and that it actually you you know it's it's down to you as as a as the professional to almost cut it off when it needs to i mean i remember you tell me telling me a story about a client a very highly affluent client that you had of yours who you know was running through a program and you kind of you stopped halfway and said i'm giving you all your money back and i don't think i can work with you anymore um, I mean, that takes, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I think for a lot of would be, should be, could be coaches and those that work in the personal development industry, that's something that most people wouldn't normally do because they think, well, I'm losing the client, I'm going to lose the money. You didn't even think about the client or the money. You're thinking about your, um, the workability. The fact of it is, is if you, f you feel like you can't add any more value, how powerful is it, you know, to say, be able to say no and actually move on? Yeah, it's just to clarify, I did tell you this, so just to clarify, um, I didn't give her the refund for everything she paid. Sure. I don't charge per session. We, we completed one third of the programs. I, I issued her with a refund for the remaining two thirds, yeah. right? So that's my kind of policy. Uh -huh. When I fire someone, obviously I need to give them some money back. But I'm not going to give them money back for the sessions we already, for the time you already had, right? Yeah, sure. When I, when I realize, uh, and it's very rare, you know, I only fired only fired one person this year, for example. It's very rare because that's what the initial consultation is for, for, for me to assess a bunch of things, including the level of content, help me with this word, mm. Com compatible, help me with this word, the level of compatible. Let's do it, compatibility. <laughs> Listen, I'm Polish, I'm not dumb. You know? <laughs> Guys, come on, I've been only here for 11 years. Come on, give me a break, right? <laughs> Well, I, maybe, 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 maybe I should go to Poland and see if I can speak Polish. <laughs> yeah, compatible. I can say compatible easily, but compatibility. Anyway, so, you know, one of the things I, I assess is this level of 
that thing that we just mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> and, and but occasionally, you know, you get it wrong, and someone comes out to be in a certain way, and then they act in a different way. Mm -hmm. And when I realized, and like I said, it's very rare. When I realized that I won't be able to deliver remarkable results to this person because they either not pulling the weight or there is something. So, so with, with this particular lady, it was more kind of personal. It's like I didn't like, I didn't appreciate the, the tone. Yeah. Like the, it was more kind of personal. It wasn't really personal, but it was more on the kind of uh, the, the, the degree to which I, I, I would enjoy working with her after the little incident that we had. I said, listen, you know what? I wish you all the best and respectfully, you know, let's let's just let's just call it a day. You know, let let's just call it a day. And 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 you know it wasn't that easy for me to send her back, you know, a few thousand pounds, whatever, but I worked really hard to get to the point where I can do that and be still fine. And now it's extremely important for me to to really enjoy what I do. In order for me to get the most out of what I can do with clients, I really need to love what I do, right? That's what I believe in. And I can only love what I do if I work with people I love. And, and, and you know, like, I, I loved her, you know, it was great. Until we had this incident, I was like, hey, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't say that, but like what I thought was like, I'm not sure I can lo love you after that, right? right. It's, 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 this is going to be yeah. there. This is going to be there, you know, so unless we can talk it through and, and, you know, find a way which she wasn't open to, you know, we respectfully went our own ways. We're still in touch, by the way, so it's not like, oh, I hate you, I hate you too. It's like, <laughs> I don't hate anyone, like, I don't have time to hate, like, I don't have time to hate, you know, I don't hold grudges, you know, but sometimes it's like, it's like, uh, you know, it's like any other relationship, it's, it's important to know wh when it's time to call it a day. Absolutely, you know? so absolutely. If, from everybody else and, and not having that thing contaminating your 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 you know your mindset your mind it, precisely and this is this is the thing you know at the end of the day it's that contamination uh, you, you you hold on to something which isn't right quite right for you if you're not enjoying it i mean i had andre pennington on earlier today and we were talking about the fact that you get into your genius mode when you're the most happiest and content that's when you kind of block out all these other things that are going on, everything else around you becomes a bit blurry and you're kind of straight into the zone. That's when you're most productive. But the minute you've got this inkling that you can't either deliver what the client's expectation is, or you feel that the relationship isn't uh, robust enough for you to actually be able to be honest the way you're going to be honest, um, it, it, gets, it gets to a stage where all you're doing is you're building up on a lie, which means that at some point it's going to break. And when it breaks, it breaks badly, very, very badly. So having the, the the inner belief in yourself to say, look, this is the right time to stop. And you know, at the end of the day, you do this because you've invested in yourself. You know you've got yourself to a certain level. And it's not an ego talk. It's more of a, I'm talking about a recognition within yourself that look, I, I don't think I can go any further with you because of this. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's something that I, I, I wanted to get out to the audiences because I find that a lot of my clients that I have to work with, are, I'm doing damage limitation and repairing. So these are people that have very bad experiences, they've lost a lot of money, they've lost a lot of confidence, and I have to spend a long time kind of re, not just transforming their mind, their, their businesses and stuff, but it's also transforming their mind and their confidence in trust in being able to trust other people. That's what, why is because what that, what's happened is other people have held on to them and they've just look, you know, I'll, I'll get you, I'll get you there, but they don't know what they're doing. And as a result of this, um, it's created these problems. And this is why I, I, I was talking about the points of certain things about ethics, about, you know, when is it right to let go, you know, staying in your lane, being investing in yourself and all these kind of stuff and making sure that you're treating your client as, as if they've just put their life in your hand in that respect. So, I, I feel tremendous sense of responsibility mm. people uh, I work with um, and you know I rarely talk about it especially like, you know it's like, oh because I have this reputation and you know he's hardcore and this and that like the, the, you know I, I would I would take it for granted most of the time because I'm so used to it right it's been fine but every now and then I would look at my I would look at my I would look at my schedule for a week yeah 
and I was names of all these people who I consider uh, friends as well, my clients who I consider friends. And I, and I look at those names and I, and I realize, I remind myself that I'm getting to spend time with these people, with these amazing fucking human beings. Yeah. I'm getting to spend time with them. I, they come to me, you know, I can make a coffee for them. We can spend time together here for an hour or two hours at a time, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, we're having this conversation, which is what coaching is, it's conversations, you know. As you know, I don't put anyone in a meditative state, you know. It's like we're having conversations. The kind of conversations I'm having with you right now. And, and somehow, in this weird way, as a result of, of series of these conversations, the life change, I create bond with these people. We stay friends often for, often for years, and I fucking get paid for it. And I get paid enough to finance everything I want to do within reason. I mean, how fucking cool is that? It's amazing. But it's, do you know what this comes down to, Michael, for me? It's the fact that you're honest with yourself. You're investing in yourself. You always continuously are learning from your finance experiences as well. And you're, you're always furthering yourself. There's never going to be a ceiling point of how great you could become at personal development or coaching or you know there's always something new to learn you you also take on clients that you know are beyond your sort of challenge means in the sense that it allows you to stretch rather than just staying in an area of complacency but have the raw honesty to be able to turn around when the relationship is going south to say look you know I respect you as a person. I want you to, you know, to be a part of my sort of friend circle. And as a result of this, that means that perhaps we, that means we've got to stop working with one another in this respect. And I think this is what gets you to this environment. Whether people look at you and say, okay, you're hard nosed, you're aggressive and, and all of this. At the end of the day, tell me one person who has been able to uh, in, uh, experience pleasure without feeling some pain in that respect. You've got to feel the pain to feel the pleasure. You've got to have disheartenment to see glory. You've got to lose to win in these kind of environments. And if you're not doing it, uh, in, and if, you've, if, you're, if you're pushing someone, I tell you something, that's because you care. It's the same thing when someone complains for bad service in a restaurant. Most people, you know, complain because they care. They care about the food, they care about the service that they want, or they care about the, 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 the business that's running there. But it's interesting how many, how many businesses, when, when they have give bad service, that they don't accept the complaints and they don't understand where the complaints come from. It's kind of one in it out the other. So look, we have some interesting uh, conversation bits. I need to take some comments from the, uh, from the audiences. We're coming very closely to the last five minutes that Mr. So was on. Believe me, I need to finish before three because Branson's in the house, you know? It, it, this this is going to get sorted out. You know, he's going to be, we, we're going to, you know, I've, I've only got five minutes to go, so. Oh, no. <laughs> without me. <laughs> he's, coming, he's coming for a coffee. He's coming for one of those signature coffees. Um, so let's have a look at what's going on here. Liam McQueen is absolutely singing your praises. Nice uh, one, Liam. Uh, Michael's amazing. Uh, Lavelle just saying when it comes down to contracts and the level of detail is critical so that's about what we were talking about earlier uh, charging premium prices people want premium services Jovan Young is in saying hey what's up um, what's that bit down down there okay Leo Eric Ketten Heidi haven't heard of Michael do you want me to train him and Leah saying I want the name of the person who didn't hear about me Jovan Young. Jovan Young has said that, but it's interesting. The conversation saying, do you want me to train him? Let's talk about it. And Liam McQueen said, he can train you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. What an insult. Oh, what a... <laughs> no, look, it's, it is, well, it's the way it rolls, the way it rolls. Listen, um, you've got a book. Um, I want to talk about this very, very quickly. Um, you know, what's the book about? Um, I, you know, how can people get hold of the book? And, and Because I know I've got one here and... Um, well, I think it's better coming from you. I could tell people what the book's about, but tell us. You wrote this book, what's it about? So it's a, it's a book called um, From Good to Amazing, which is a premise of everything that I do. The people I work with, they're already doing okay most of the time, and the idea is to take them to this exceptional, amazing level. And it's a very simple book. Somebody said it's a kind of book you can, you can read in the toilet, which was the big compliment I received. I think it was Daniel Priestley, my coach, who said that. It's the kind of book you can read in the toilet. So thanks, Daniel. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's written in a very conversational style. Everybody who knew me said, Michael, this is like listening to you speak. Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, the subtitle is 
no bullshit tips for the life you always wanted. So it's a combination of, it's, it's a collection of, of, of my top tips from different areas of personal development, uh, you know, very easy to read, uh, very direct, believe it or not. Um, I've been procrastinating on finishing my second book called Love Everyone, Take Shit From No One. Um, but it's gonna come, it's gonna, it's gonna come, it's gonna come. I like that. It's, Don't procrastinate over it. Get it done now. I mean, I've I've written my one as well about your attitude sucks, and uh, it's just been a situation of kind of do I give it to the publisher or not, which is where my procrastination. I just I, I, I just I I just drew a line and said that's it. Send it in now. It's enough. Enough is enough, basically. So I want to see this book coming out. So sure, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'm like, oh, as soon as I said that you know I'm procrastinating on finishing the second book, I thought. Damn! I need a life coach in my life. I need, I need Michael Serra in my life. You need, like, you need, you need a Michael Serra in your life. Yeah, you need to start coaching yourself, brother. <laughs> Pay myself a few, few thousand pounds, get a big mirror, and and just kick my my own ass. This is. Oh, oh it's, it's um, you know, when it comes to procrastination, you you know, we always go for the reason why. You know, like we want to get to the to the reason why people do what they. Why people want to do that thing they want to do, and, and and then you know to use that to help them with this procrastination thing. And the reality is that my reason why as to writing the second book is not big enough. And I know it's not. I had a big reason why to write the first book because I wanted to have a book. If I meet you, I'm not going to give you two copies of two different books. I'm going to give you just one, right? Yeah. And start. It wasn't about launching my writing career. It was about creating an extension of my business card. So I will, I will write a second book probably eventually, but I'm not in a rush, let me put it this That's way. Good. That's good. absolutely amazing. So look, we're, we're fast wrapping up. Is, uh, uh, we've only got two minutes to go here. Michael, how can people get hold of the book? Okay, so it's very simple. Um, if you Google my name, the first, the first website you're gonna see, it's my website. The first, yeah, the web, yeah, it's gonna be my website. If you go to my website, so it's michaelserra.com. Uh, there's a section of my web of my website called the book, and you can get a book from there. You can go to Amazon from there, or you can just go to Amazon anywhere in the world. And if you if you type in Michael Serwa, there's no other Michael Serwa. If I was Michael Jackson, oh, imagine that. Yeah. It's dramatic, you know. <laughs> uh, there's no other Michael Serwa who wrote a book. So if you just Google my name, all different things will come out, you know, yeah. check out my website, connect with me uh, via social media, particularly Facebook, that's where I'm most active. Uh, check out my LinkedIn content, uh, the articles there, check out my YouTube content, there's more interviews and, okay. and uh, kind of footages of me public speak. And is there, a, is there a way through the website to also get connected to you? Because if there are people out here saying, I, I actually need a bit of Michael Sarah in my life, they can connect with you and, 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 and sort of apply to, to come and work with you? Sure, so I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm inviting all of you listening. Uh, you know, the fact that you're listening to us and you got all the way to the end says a lot. In fact, if you're listening to it later, yes. uh, uh, that, that's okay too. So you are most likely or most probably, let me rephrase that, the kind of person I could work with. So if you think you could use a little bit of coaching in your life and if you go to my website, like we said, uh, you will find more details about how I work and what are the areas I work with people on. If you think that you could be someone uh, that could work with me and, and uh, we, I could add value to your life, get in touch with me. We're going to schedule this initial consultation here in my place. I'll make a coffee for you if you like coffee. If not, uh, you know, I'll make some tea, English breakfast, whatever, El Grey, uh, <laughs> whatever you want, whatever you wish. And we're just going to have a conversation. Um, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. Um, we're just going to have a conversation that will be valuable for you in itself. And then we'll see what we will come out of it. And you to think, oh, perhaps I could benefit from coaching, but like, I'm pretty sure you're going to be too expensive for me. Don't worry, because I have an, a, an amazing team of associates. So whatever your budget is, we can help you. Coaching change lives. There you go. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. So on behalf of Enterprise Lab and the League of Disruptors show, Michael Server. I salute you. Thank you very much for the time and the insights, the raw honesty in, in what you've been talking about here today. Uh, we'll definitely get all your links and everything posted up onto the live feed uh, very, very shortly. For, for those of you, go on to michaelsower.com and you'll be able to get the book and get access to 
to, to Michael's programs and stuff as, as such. That, that's, that's it for today. Tomorrow we've got two more intense um, uh, shows to come up, basically at 2 o'clock and then one at 8 o'clock in the evening all the way from the US. But for today, Michael Sowa, you are an awesome man. I can see how you don't just improve people's lives, you change them. And the very best of luck with everything that you're doing. And for the you guys here in the audience, thanks for joining us today. And I'll see you guys again sometime very, very soon. Thank you, Katana. Thank you, guys.